the 2021 Abu Dhabi GP, Michael Massey said an iconic quote, Toto, we just went motor racing. Well, I don't think that was quite applicable for that very race. I think when you look back at the 2023 Italian GP, the one line that you can use to describe it is Toto, we went motor racing. Because that, folks, is what you watch motor racing for. For records to be broken, for fans to be celebrating. And at the end of the day, some absolutely brilliant action between two teammates. That is why we watch Formula 1 in the first place. And so, even though Max Verstappen has now gone on and broken my dear favourite Sebastian Vettel's record, I don't quite feel bad about it. But the biggest story this weekend, ladies and gentlemen, and this is what we are going to discuss in great depth, is what is the biggest surprise? Is it the fact that we had a Ferrari on pole in Monza? Or is it the fact that Sergio Perez made it on the podium? All of this and more is going to be discussed on this episode of the Inside Line F1 podcast. This is our Italian GP review. My name is Tomo Arora. I'm the host of the Driving Force on Disney Plus Hotstar and also of the Indian Racing League on Star Sports. And let's just go out to all of our co-hosts as well. I'll start off with you, Sundaram. F1 stats guru. You're on the WTF1 talent roster of content creators as well. And in that pool of roster, you kind of create lots of really exciting and engaging content where you get to know more about Formula 1. But in this weekend, I just want to know, what did you really observe about Ferrari? Because something clicked. I still don't know what. And I'm so happy about it at the end of the day. I think we don't know what exactly clicked. But the one thing that I was happy to see was happy faces at the Ferrari camp. camp. You don't tend to see that. But it always ends with Ferrari doing Ferrari things, which we'll kind of dissect a little later. But <laughs> it was nice to see Ferrari doing well at home uh, and doing well in general uh, for a change. And Kunal, you were the former marketing head of the Force India F1 team. You were currently working at the Italian GP in your capacity as the F1 consultant at the Viaplay Network. And while working on the broadcast, I know we were prepping together heading into the weekend saying that, oh my God, the Tifosi, everyone should go home. It's probably the one race they should absolutely write off. But we got a Ferrari on pole. And more importantly, the two Ferraris did not crash. So even though they did Ferrari things, they still got something decent, which is great. A big surprise, no? It's a great surprise. And I can tell you why Ferrari were actually quick, right? And I'm going to start with an with an analogy that we've probably all used in life. You know, remember when we go to school and say there are five subjects, we need to give an examination for. But you focus on that one subject, which you're really good at. Let's say it's math, for example, and then you just prepare a little bit more for math. So you're like, hey, I'm not going to top uh, the class or the university uh, as a whole, but can I top in math? And that's what Ferrari did. They realized Of course, it's Monza, it's the Tifosi, it's their home race, lots of history. The legend of Ferrari grows. It it was born at Monza in itself, right? So they realized, hey, the low downforce configuration works really well for us. Why don't we have a Monza-specific package? So they brought a Monza-specific package. They put on new power units for both their drivers. So basically, they said, well, let's throw everything at it. If there's one race, we will try and stop Red Bull from winning everything. It's going to be Monza. So the the, the, the theory is, Samuel and Sundaram, that Monza is usually an outlier. Red Bull, Aston Martin, for example, don't really have a Monza-specific configuration. But Ferrari do. So that's the reason, ladies and gentlemen, why Ferrari, why Ferrari actually did so well in Monza. And it's also funny, right? It's true. A yellow Ferrari is always better than a red Ferrari. It's, it's just a fact of life. A red Ferrari is normal. A yellow one, just that little bit more special. And maybe that also got helped out in that regard. But I was surprised to see Charles Leclerc not being on the pole. Instead, it was Carlos Sainz, which was great. I think my money's finally paying off. But before we properly dissect into the hows and what's of Ferrari, I think we ought to talk a little bit about the record breaker just today. I mean, he, he's done 10 races in a row. There's not much more that can be said. So let's just give him the due minute that he deserves. All I'm going to say is, for all you Sebastian Vettel fans out there, Seb is still the youngest world champion. So don't be disappointed. He still has one meaningful record. And at the end of the day, I don't think that one is going to be broken. But considering the pace at which Max is breaking every single record out there, I think he's going to find a way to get some younger age pills as well to go back in time and to break that record as well, Sundaram. Because the numbers are just 
they, they they just feel like a pack of dominoes at this stage. Max pushes one, and fifteen different records tend to get broken around every weekend. I think that's one record where Verstappen is really going to regret not having the one for the youngest world champion. He does have the youngest race winner record, but knowing when he started out as a 17-year-old kid, he would have really liked to have that one record. And unfortunately, that's never going to happen, be it in terms of double championships, triple championships, or even four times. He's not going to be the youngest one out there, but he's literally gone on to smash every other record there is. And winning 10 races in a row or even 9 races in a row was probably the hardest of all the records that he could take and he's not had it easy also in the last couple of races especially in Sandford how tricky it was and even Carlos Sainz did not make it easy for him in the first 14 laps as in Carlos Sainz uh, 14 laps is the most a non red bull driver wow. has led this season so it's not been easy for Verstappen but this is the sort of brilliance that you tend to see. Once he finds an opportunity, once he made Carlos Sainz make a mistake, he then had the lead and it was just to uh, make it to the checkered flag. But what I really find amazing, Kunal, is that even though now in terms of numbers, he might be one up on Sebastian Vettel, let's face the facts. Fast and Furious 7 was the 7th highest, actually not the 7th, I think the 11th highest grossing movie of all time. But by no means was it better than The Dark Knight Rises, which is 35th highest grossing. So the numbers don't always tell the whole story. Seb is still a little bit more special, no? It depends. Uh, it depends what generation of Formula One fans you ask <coughs> this question to. But, you know, <laughs> let's enjoy Max for who he is without comparing him to anyone else. Because Max has a different style of dominance as well, right? Like I said on Wire Play this weekend, you know, he's battling a different rival every race weekend. In Sanford, there was someone else. It was Fernando Alonso. In Spa, there was uh, Charles Leclerc, uh, Ferrari. In Hungary, it was Mercedes. Earlier on in the season, uh, you know, there was also McLaren at one of the races. This weekend, it was it was uh, Carlos uh, Sainz. So he's battling different rivals from different teams and like Sundaram pointed out, different circumstances at different circuit configurations as well. So it's just a different way that he's been doing it. So yes, while you know some of the members in the paddock have very nicely pointed out that Max doesn't have or hasn't had the strongest of teammates, a, you know, a point that I actually don't agree with, he has had one of the strongest rivals constantly battling him for P2, including Checo Perez and himself. And yes, Carlos Sainz made a mistake, but even though Max won in Monza, Carlos was the entertainer, 100%. There's no doubt yeah. he was the driver of the day. And, you know, one of the reasons he made the mistake was not because he made a driver error under pressure. He just used up so much of his tires while battling Max Verstappen, mm. trying to keep him behind that he just ran out of tires at the end. And it was either Max having a clean run at him or him making a mistake the way he did under pressure. Wait, one sec. So you're calling Carlos Sainz an entertainer. Does that mean he technically is the lion in the Ferrari circus, in a way? No? No. Okay. That one didn't land. The visibility around as Mumbai. Long as he's the he, he's the <laughs> stallion. <laughs> no, the visibility around he Mumbai is quite bad car. today. So jokes are not landing. But he yeah, was but the quicker but, but, car. But, but, yeah, but yeah. I must say he was the quicker car. And, you know, as much as Charles wanted the podium and the pole, the truth is, and this is where I love Carlos Sainz. Carlos Sainz chose a setup on Friday, which worked. Charles went the other way and Charles was happy to admit it didn't work. So guess whose setup he copied? It was Carlos Sainz's setup. And that's why Charles was eventually as fast as Carlos Sainz. And in a way, I'm glad that Ferrari didn't really have team orders to have one driver finish ahead of the other and so on. They let them fight. And literally, the faster Ferrari driver took pole and the faster Ferrari driver took the podium in Monza. But the interesting thing is, I know Carlos Sainz, he wears a lot of hats. He's he's often <laughs> the race strategist as well. But yesterday after the race, he's also had to do a little bit of running, sprinting to try and uh, get back his watch, which was stolen by a couple of these. So he had a pretty hectic uh, Italian Grand Prix weekend. But, but I have an interesting point. I think 
Carlo Sainz is also one of the reasons why Charles Leclerc was not on the podium. Because if you look at the classification, Sainz and Leclerc, they finished roughly five seconds off Checo Perez. And Checo Perez in the first half of the race was was involved in a battle with George Russell. Had had Ferrari kind of invoked team orders and let Leclerc pass Sainz, he would have not have been held back to the extent where he kind of ran into Sergio hmm. Perez towards the end. So I feel at least if maybe if Perez would not have overtaken, it would have been a little bit more difficult at least hmm. for him towards the end. It, it's a good theory. It's a very good theory. But I think the Red Bulls were so quick that it was almost eventual that they would take the 1-2. And I think this was the hardest fought 1-2 for Red Bull pretty much in the recent past that I've noticed. It was also Red Bull's first ever 1-2 in Monza. And traditionally, they've never really done well at Monza because they've never really focused on the outlier that Monza needs in terms of technical setup. But I personally feel that Carlos Sainz, Ferrari, Charles Leclerc maxed out their opportunities. And this I, I wouldn't sort of subscribe to this could have, would have gotten second place with Leclerc, <laughs> etc. Because all the hard work, mind you, was being done by Carlos Sainz up front, you know, trying to win the race. And they were trying to give the best driver a best shot. So all in all, a, a fantastic motor race. And what I really loved, guys, was... You know, usual metric for a good motor race is we had 166 overtakes, 183 overtakes, highest ever. I don't even know. I don't even care how many overtakes happened in Monza. But we got to see wheel-to-wheel battle. Yes. For the lead, for the podium finishes. I mean, Max had to really work hard. And it was so smart, right? It was like a game of chess. Carlos Sainz had the straight line speed advantage. So much so that with the DRS on and the DRS effect is anyway low in Monza, with the DRS on, Max Verstappen couldn't still chase him down. So it was either at the pits or, you know, putting one of the drivers under pressure and getting the Ferrari to run out of their tires that Max could have made the overtake. And that's eventually what happened. And did you guys really miss DRS aided overtakes here? No, absolutely not. I think that's why I mentioned that this felt like a proper motor race because that's what you do in a motor race. You play with the minds of the other drivers and you come up with on-ground strategies to make yourself win. And by that logic, I prefer this Max Verstappen win over any other one that he's had so far this year because the man has had to work for it, really, generally. I mean, I know the other ones also he's had to work for it. Not that he's sitting and chilling, but this one more so than ever. And that's where your racecraft really comes in handy, which is what I also loved about that whole Leclerc and Sainz battle syndrome. The fact that they let them race, I think at that point, they accepted defeat that they can't quite get to Sergio Perez. But nevertheless, we got entertainment. We got motor racing. And it was not that it always worked out. In the case of Lewis Hamilton and Oscar Piastri, it didn't. But we also saw them treating each other like gentlemen, apologizing and letting that go past. So, This is what we watch motorsport for, good hard racing. And now that we've got it, some people on Twitter are saying, eh, boring race. What? What do you watch motor racing for then? I think everyone has a different lens at looking at Formula 1 races. They expect every race to be extremely entertaining, down to uh, the flag, down to the uh, checkered flag. But... This was a difficult, a different type of race. It's not like the races that you tend to see at Hungary or or in Spain, where strategy kind of is the dictating factor. You have a team or a driver going the longer route in terms of pitch strategy or having a tire offset. None of that stuff. This was typical Monza, down to pace, down to what what engine output you have, and it is all down to how well you are able to capitalize on that, and. Coming back to overtakes, there were only 24 overtakes in this race, which is much less than what Monza usually sees. But still, we had a very entertaining race throughout 51 laps. And I think that was the the nice part of it, being able to enjoy a race despite not having enough overtakes. Ah, that's the whole point, right? You don't really need something absolutely crazy. You don't need DRS. You don't need some speed racer-like gimmick. All you need is alternate tyre allocation and a good circuit. But let's talk about ATA for a second. Or how do you pronounce it, guys? Is it Atta? A- Atta? Or Atta, which is the word for wheat in Hindi? I don't know. Whatever it is. But did you guys think it worked out this weekend? Because the order remained relatively similar. But I think when we talked about free practice, right? And how setups were being constantly changed. 
I think it really adds value there that the drivers have to be even sharper, which is something that Sergio Perez, unfortunately, had to learn the hard way, Kunal, because his car wasn't quite set up well. His qualifying was traditionally horrible, but then he got enough time in the race to learn the car as it came about and come up with a pretty good result at the end. So I, I like it. I, I like the way it's going so far, more volatility. And it tests out the drivers who are meant to be the best in the world. So can you adapt to a car in just 60 minutes? I think there are two there are two coins. I, I would say I like it, but I would still want some tweaks to it, if I may put it as that. So what do I like about the ATA? That, you know, it's forcing the teams and drivers to be competitive and quick and on a single lap on every compound, right? Uh, the hard, the medium, and the soft through qualifying. But the impact of fewer sets was actually felt on free practice, because they were putting in fewer laps. They were using fewer sets because they had fewer sets. And the the reason why I would say it's a little strange is you're putting up this whole show, driving in hundreds and thousands of fans, but you're not giving them enough laps. And yes, it's for environmental reasons, etc. But I, I don't understand why the core product of racing is always the first one they pull things out of or strike things off from when it comes to environment. I mean, the whole operation of formula one in itself has so many more elements i would assume where environmental impact can and is being felt but just leave the tires alone and as lewis hamilton said what's happened to all the inters and vets that were brought to monza but not used wait but don't you think it's actually not hindered the core product do you think so because i don't see how it's hindered the core core product no more volatility is just better entertainment and What's the trickier drive, trickier conditions for the toughest athletes in the world? What do you so reckon? More, more volatility. You know, if we sit to measure this metric, were there any surprise Q1 eliminations? Yes, you could say Alpine was a surprise Q1 elimination. They had a double Q1 elimination. Fair, right? But wait, not launch roll? I mean, <laughs> well, you expect him to be there, don't well, you? Yeah. Well, <laughs> and, and just, just to add, I mean, yes. It, or it offered some bit of volatility. Was it Monza or was it the ATA that got out Alpine? I think it was Monza in general. It wasn't just the ATA, right? But the, the bigger challenge here, Samuel, is that, uh, you know, drivers themselves have said that when you force teams to use harder compounds, the faster teams in general tend to do better. And that's true, right? Because what happens in typical qualifying, right? You have a Haas. They're saying everybody else is on the medium. I'm going to put on the soft and get through to Q2 if I can. But hey, when it comes to the ATA, you can't really do that as a team. You're then forced to use a particular compound. Yeah, that's that's true in a way. But again, that at the cost of saving 3,000 tires a year feels like, I think I've probably saved 3,000 tires a year. That's just me. We clearly know your take on it. I'm not saying that you're not an environmentalist. You live in the country that's the most environmentally friendly in the world. And if you said something like that, they'd probably boot you out immediately. But what do you think about it, Sundaram? Because what we got from that is Sergio Perez having to work even harder and finally salvage a podium, which in my mind is the biggest story of the weekend. But for some reason, we just don't pay attention to it every single time. Max will take prominence. Ferrari will take prominence. But guys... A guy has come back with such great redemption. He's not been on the podium for months now. It must be the greatest satisfaction in the world. But we just don't talk about it, Sundaram. We're we're bad people, yeah. We're horrible people. I think we're overhyping Checo in this sense because it's always (laughs) been a case where he kind of underperforms on Saturday and he kind of balances it out and goes on to become the hero by uh, overtaking a couple of slow cars. If you have that that speed demon of a car, ideally you're expected to finish, to qualify in the top two, top four maybe, but he's always been qualifying even lower than that. But yesterday when he was really battling it out with with the Ferraris and even with with George Russell, I felt this is a crucial race for Sergio Perez because if he's not able to take that car to P2, there's going to be a lot of criticism coming his way. Thankfully, he did manage to take it to P2, but if he had not managed to get past Carlos Sainz, he was really trying hard. He was he was doing all sorts of tricks, even over the radio, trying to, to mention that he's pushed him off. He's, he's done that a couple of times, but eventually he managed to take it to P2, and I think that is worth mentioning, and that that is a commendable effort. But Checo does have to be a little bit more consistent on Saturdays. 
Three years of lockdown, three years of using digital devices to record episodes, and I still haven't learned this one trick. I have still put my mic on mute. Here we go. But uh, I see a lot of new Formula One fans join in, right? And every single time we have a word about Checo, it's always positive because they, unfortunately, aren't quite aware of the dynamics of qualifying. So they watch the race on Sunday and they're like, bro, Sergio Perez is the man, man. He comes from P17 up to P4 and P5. What a driver. I love him. So if 10 years later, we have to go to remember the legacy of Checo Perez, in the minds of all the casual fans, it'll, it'll be quite positive, which is not bad. Good to good to build a post-race, uh, post-Formula race, post 1 pundit-based career on that one in that regard, if he wants to really. But that's not what we should be talking about. What we should be talking about is the racing action, because there were tons of it. We saw the McLarens colliding with each other. We saw Hamilton and Oscar Piastri having a bit of a battle. But what was most surprising to me, Kunal, was the fact that you can pass a Williams on the straight. It was amazing. Alex Albon, we had the train briefly. Lando Norris couldn't get past. But it is fun watching Alex Albon here in Italy, which is what we also predicted. And we got our top five finish uh, bet thing successful as well, which is nice on us. Two, two races in a row. Hats off. Hats off to you. Hats off to Sundaram. Hats off to what we do together on the Inside Line F1 podcast. Alexander Albin knew all along. He said he had marked this, uh, you know, he had marked this race on his calendar ever since the start of the season because he knew they had the package for Monza. He knew he had this one race to deliver and he didn't have this race last year because of his appendicitis operation that he had to go through and Nick DeFries did the magic that he did. Now, he actually delivered in qualifying. The Williams were the quickest cars on the hard tyre. That also dictated some of their race strategy. They were the first ones to switch to the hard tyre, hoping to sort of have the train and stick a few people uh, behind them. They managed with the McLarens. But Lewis Hamilton on the medium, they had to, you know, they, 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 sw- they had the reverse strategy on both the Mercedes drivers. Lewis Hamilton on the medium, was able to overtake Alexander Albin eventually. And Albin, who somehow somebody's named him the tire whisperer, you know, I I don't think that's the most obvious thing, but either way, uh, he did 35 laps on the hard tire, which were most than any other driver on the grid. But that's just Williams. And they, they knew they had to be on the hard the soonest they could. And that's what they did eventually. And I like that. I like that Williams are able to eke out points from these quirky little races where they normally shouldn't quite, at least until a couple of years ago, be there in the points. So I like this. I like how things are going over there. And these are the races, honestly, Sundaram, that we should see someone like Alpine get in the points or even someone like Lance Stroll. I know it's expected of them right now. At this stage, if you expect good results from all three of them, it's probably the wrong thing to do. Maybe you aren't an experienced enough Formula 1 fan. But nevertheless, it you need to set some expectations, even though they're low. But what these three drivers performed, Ocon, Gasly and Stroll, was even lower than the low expectations. And honestly, if Alex Albon is getting in points, if McLarens are not really doing very well this weekend, that just pains me to see that these guys were not there to capitalize on it. I mean, imagine me being a casual observer feeling that bad. Imagine the mood in the garage in that regard. Now, my disappointment in in Alpine and Renault has has no limit. I've I've, I've said this multiple times, this being... (laughs) <laughs> a works team does not have its act together. And Al- Esteban Oak... What works? <laughs> Wait a minute. What do you mean by works team? Nothing is working, buddy. <laughs> exactly. And Esteban Ocon and Pierre Gasly are otherwise good drivers. I mean, you've seen what Pierre Gasly is able to do when he was in the Alpha Tauri after his demotion from Red Bull. You would have probably expected him to go the Kvyat way, but... Gasly did extremely well during his time in Alpha Tauri, and that's one of the reasons why he got this Alpine seat. But they're not able to use that potential. They're not able to show all that they have on track because that car is that unreliable. And we say Ferrari does Ferrari things, but the Alpine's engine is doing Alpine engine things. There's there's also a lot of talk about it having a power deficit. There's a lot of uh, discussions of, uh, ha- happening around that as well. But it's a team that's been blowing hot and cold. They blew. They they did extremely well in Monaco, and they kind of tapered off. And they did well at Zandvoort. I know it was, it was also due to the the circumstances, and Gasly was able to capitalize on it. But a very sad weekend where both of them got qualified, the kicked out of Q1, and they were not able to get anything out of the race. It's it's just sad. And 
as for lance stroll i don't know if we have any expectations from him at all because he is the only driver in the top 11 to not have a podium even esteban ocon and pierre gasly have a podium lance stroll doesn't and him not being able to get enough points has now meant aston martin is fourth in the constructors below ferrari incredible right ferrari actually pulled that one in monza and got p3 in the constructors championship but just just a wee bit about alpine you know the the funny thing is on friday after the free practice sessions they were actually slow but pierre gasly actually said to the media that it was unspectacular but it was still a very solid friday for us i really don't know what the solid would mean if it means a q1 exit and not not scoring points but it it it's probably again one of those power deficits to their power unit and hence as a result just not able to perform on these really long straights and they're waiting for an equalization once it is approved by the other teams and the FIA as well right but alban who we actually just spoke of i'm just going to go back to him for a bit in the last two races alexander alban has scored 10 points well yes that's a lot for williams but that's the same number of points that george russell lando norris have scored which is 10 points lance stroll has actually scored 0 in that time esteban uh-huh. ocon has scored 1 and oscar piastri has scored 2 points that's just how well alexander albon has gone in sunford and in monza and uh, talking about lance stroll it amazes me that mike crack still is making statements like the gap between stroll and alonso is actually very small i think i think that's just money to one second we can, we one can laugh second. it off one second so if the gap between stroll and alonso is small sundaram what was the gap between verstappen and carlos sainz in qualifying there was no gap no i think they both said the same lap time if that's the case 0.013 seconds Oh what a huge gap man oh my god oh 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 what there yeah i think i think 2 tenths is a small gap rather 3 tenths on a lap uh, is a small gap but yeah 100th per lap is is a huge one some okay, does does my crack no racing i think he does right he's meant to be a racing he guy he does yeah 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 but the the, the funny nice. thing is and i don't I, i don't know if somel caught it given his love for lance stroll max verstappen when he ended the race GP Jean-Pierre Lambiet his engineer who we all know is his fiercest rival uh, these days in formula 1 came on the radio and said it was a stroll in the park lance wasn't it and i don't know if that was a pun on lance stroll in <laughs> itself but i just burst out laughing <laughs> no it's awesome to see them reminding the world who the best driver in the world really is fernando alonso now nah. uh, but the point being ladies and gentlemen this was a great weekend of motorsport and If there's one line that I'd like to use to end it all off, it is, guys, did we get it? Did we get it? We did get a good race at the end. We were hoping, we were dying for a good one after a while. And finally, Monza has delivered as well. And next up is going to be Singapore. Now, there is a fortnight's break. We will be coming back with a really special episode of the Inside Line F1 podcast in the middle. And yes, there is also going to be a live event in Mumbai for the Singapore GP as well. So. Stay tuned for all of that stuff folks. Check out the links in our description for our social media profiles to see how you can keep up with us. But for now, I suppose that is all. Bake in the glory of rather not bake in the glory. It's not a, you're not a cake, are you? You bask in the glory of Max Verstappen's records. Enjoy the couple of weekends that we have now folks and see you for this uh, for the Singapore GP preview. Love you. Take care. Bye-bye.